What's up everyone, Lance Hedrick here, and today we're gonna take a look at the WUG2. Not much to look at, but it is a world's first grinder in what it can do. I might even say it's the best value in game grinder currently on the market. So that's a big claim. Why am I saying that? Obviously, as you know, the people who have been on this channel for a while know I have gone through more than dozens of grinders. I mean, probably hit about 100 that I have owned and, and used at this point. And so I'm, I'm very confident in my understanding of different grinders and what all they offer. And this one offers something completely unique that nothing else on the market has done yet. Ever, even since this has come out, I have not yet seen another one do this. I could be wrong. There could be something floating out there that's not really gotten any attention, but this one is underground enough. So I doubt that there's anything else that's kind of like this. Now, you might be asking, Okay, let's get to it. What is it about this grinder that makes it so unique? That's a great question, my student. But this grinder can house either flat burrs or cone burrs. Yes, you can swap it out, and because of the way the motor is working, it can swap the oscillations the way that it spins so that it can use both cone burrs, which spin in one way, and flat burrs, which tend to spin in the other way. In this, you have the capability, depending on the plates that you buy, when I mean plate, I mean something like this that can house the burr, you can do either 80 millimeter burrs, screwed or screwless as of now, 83 millimeter flat burrs, or you can do a 71 millimeter cone or an 83 millimeter cone. All of them are capable in this grinder. And when you buy the grinder, you actually get 25% off all of the, up to four different like burr carries and burrs. Pretty crazy deal. When you talk about in-game grinders, most of them sit over 2,000 dollars or 2,000 euros. And this sits at 1,600 euros and kind of gives you the best of all worlds. So depending on how much you want to spend, you can have all of your dream grinders kind of in one. That's pretty awesome. But of course, of course, there are some downfalls which we'll get into in today's video. But to give you an idea of some of the burr options you have, you could do the Mazer 83mm burrs which is housed in something like the Weber Key and the Weber HG1. You can do something like the 71mm Mazer burrs or the 71mm SSP cone and you can put that in here. You could do the new slew of 83mm burrs ever since the DF83 and the Niche 83 have come out. You can do all the 80mm burrs which is a plethora because of the Diddings and the Weber EG1. This can even hold the core burrs which are made for the EG1 and they're offered whenever you get online to check out. I saw this was being kind of talked about in some places online and I saw that Dan was working on this. Dan is the person who kind of owns this company and I reached out to him asking when they'd be shipping and I ended up putting a pre-order in and got one from the first run. So mine is a little outdated. There have been some improvements which we'll get into but for the most part my thoughts on this are going to stand with all the modifications that have been added to it because I, I know about them and I'll be able to speak to them. So what's interesting about this company is they actually started by making motors for the Weber Workshops HG1 slash HG2. You would, you were able to take that, that hand crank off and put a motor on, which would in effect give you what is now the Weber key. But he was doing that prior to that being released, was selling these attachments where you could take apart the handle and put on a motor and then you'd have a motorized HG1 which would give you essentially a motorized 83 millimeter conical burr grinder. But over time, he decided to make his own grinder. And so while he still does sell that pack for the HG1 or HG2, he now has his own grinder, which I think has an ingenious method about it, which allows for an incredible grinding experience. Well, how difficult is it to switch burrs? I don't want to switch burrs every day, blah, 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 blah. And I get that, that's completely fair. So we'll go ahead and attack that head on. So it takes about four or five minutes to switch the burrs out. Uh, and we'll go through that in this video. I'll do the whole burr changing process, we'll put in these Mazer cones uh, so that you can see that. So something that that might be appealing is I know a lot of people will have, will, they'll go through their phases of different types of coffees they want to enjoy. Some days, sometimes they'll get a bag of a darker roasted coffee because they want that thick, syrupy, gooey, chocolatey kind of coffee. Some days they want a lighter coffee, they want something floral, they want something nuanced. And so with each bag of coffee, maybe you could switch out the burrs or if you're really into like lever style espresso, you could put in a certain type of burr versus if you have like a decent espresso 
press a machine and you like to you go through phases on the different types of curves you like to do, you can switch out burrs to better fit that system. But in this situation, I ended up getting the 80 millimeter carrier because I had all those 80 millimeter burrs from my EG1. Of course, now I have a ton of 83 millimeter burrs, but this was over a year and a half ago when I ordered this. Actually, I believe it was about two years ago at this point that I actually ordered this. I opted to get the 83 millimeter Mazer as my cone option because I wanted to see if this would emulate the quality or something like the Weber key. And just to let you know right now, it absolutely does. Now there is variable RPM control on this. Of course, you have to have something like that in order to stay competitive in today's market. And this one goes from 80 to 700. Now the recommendation here is to use around 80 to 200 for when you use cone burrs and 400 to 700 when you use flats. And it's as easy as using these two little buttons right on top to go up and down, up and down, very intuitive. Now one thing that can get a little confusing is there's a, a button beside the on button. So you have four buttons on top. You have the turn on to start grinding, turn off to stop grinding. Then you have this button that either stays indented or it stays out. Now this is switching between your flat and your cone system. What this controls is the way the motor is running, so it spins the axle one way or the other. This is very important to get right. You can mess your burrs up if you're spinning it the opposite direction. You can mess up the motor. You can mess a lot of things up, at least on my unit, and I'm sure this is consistent throughout. But when this button is depressed, then you have that's ready for flat burrs. So it's spinning it away for flat burrs. If it's out, then you're spinning it away for cone burrs. And you need to remember that when you're switching out the burrs, etc. End engine, flat, out, cone. So you have the start button, you have the button for flat versus cone, and then you have two buttons to go up and down in RPM, 80 to 200 for cones, 400 to 700 for flats. My dream was, oh my goodness, if this could be essentially a Weber Workshops EG1 and a Weber Key in one, that would be incredible. And at $1,600, then you have to add money if you're getting a lot of burrs, etc. This could be an absolute titan for the price, so you don't have to have multiple grinders kind of littering your coffee station. Of course, I know it's easier with more than one grinder, but if you can do an all-in-one stop, that's kind of nice. So I got it in the hopes of it doing that. And honestly, for the most part, whenever you're talking about quality of the coffee coming out, it does match that. The thing I do want to note is the alignment on this is absolutely fantastic. With every unit that is shipped out, Dan takes a video of him using a dial indicator on the axle itself. So you can see your specific unit and how aligned it is. And they have a tolerance of 30 microns on the wobble of the shaft so that you can ensure that the tolerances are really tight there. So he's very very intense on alignment. And he actually sent me mine with my burrs aligned as well. I took it out and I had uh, pieces of green shims inside because he had aligned it himself. Even if you have a perfectly aligned shaft, you could still have misaligned burrs, right? Interesting thing that I saw someone post about in Espresso Aficionado Discord by, I believe his username is slightly dozen flat bottom brewers or something like that. He posted that he aligned his burr on the rotating carrier using a micrometer. So he essentially took one of these and he was able to measure around the carrier and the burr itself to see if there were any places where it was higher or lower. And so if he found a place, he would just shove a shim in there depending on the amount it said it was off. And so knowing the size of aluminum foil or aluminum tape, you'll be able to get it exactly. And you can keep doing that using one of these tools until you're at perfect alignment with that uh, carrier. Now that is an amazing way to align that carrier because normally you have to shim, use the marker test, shim, use the marker test. But the marker test doesn't tell you exactly what's happening under load, this will objectively give you a lined burr on burr carrier. Once the carrier is aligned, the it is attached to the shaft with a big screw, and so it should be perfectly aligned. And then the other one, I guess you could use a marker test in order to shim that one on, but for the most part, out of the box, these are very, very well aligned. Now, since this first run, they have changed a couple of things on the unit, which I do not have. The first big change is a finer thread pitch, which is a welcome improvement. Now, every tick is five microns, so that you have incredibly granular control over your adjustments. Just like on the EG1, which has five microns per tick, this gives you five microns. Microns. Now, granted, this is stepless, but every tick you see will equate to about five microns of burr movement. Now, another big thing that they have changed is they now have a side funnel in order to feed. One of my biggest gripes about this, and why I was not a fan of using it, is the way that you put the beans in. I have a photo here from David Nolet. Uh, this is what it looks like. They haven't started shipping them out yet, but this is an improvement going forward that they will be offering. So you'll just be able to load into the side and it'll feed immediately into the burr chamber 
Emperor itself. So that is a fantastic addition that honestly was the biggest reason I stalled making this video is I could not stand the workflow of dumping beans in. Now, because this space is so narrow, they do send a narrow dosing cup so that you can kind of fit in order to dose in. So right here is where you have the feeding area, the feeding funnel. And so you need something that can fit in there for, for dosing purposes. And so obviously that can get annoying and this is very small. It only holds like max 20 grams of beans and you have to sit here and kind of pop, 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 which is a little annoying. So now with this new side feeding system, that's gonna make life a lot easier. The workflow is gonna go way, way up. Now, speaking of workflow, there is something that will annoy a lot of people. There's no real way to grind direct into portafilter. Now, the way that you grind is once it goes into here, the burrs are in here, horizontally mounted, and it feeds directly into this dosing cup. And when I say direct, I mean there is nothing under the burr. When If you were to take these off and look, you see that bottom rotating carrier just going and going. You see grounds flying out. They have this magnetic system like this so it all comes apart very nicely now a, a gripe I have about this while I love magnets I find these to be a little too weak I don't know if they've improved that since then uh, but these come off very easily and it's not as easy to put back on because the magnets aren't strong enough to kind of suck it into place so that can be a little annoying of course it stays just fine once it's on there it's on there fine and it's just holding coffee powder, but still it comes on and off really easily. And then you have the dosing cup here. Now, because it's such a small little clearance area right here, see sometimes because those magnets are so weak, you gotta kind of finesse it on. <sighs> that is an annoyance. Uh, I just wish the magnets were stronger so it would kind of catch in place. If you take a 58 millimeter portafilter and you put like a funnel on it, it doesn't, it doesn't fit. If you go straight here, then you could have spraying, which would be annoying since you don't have you don't have anything really there. Maybe you could 3D print something to have this completely blocked there, but even still when you pull down, if there's a mound, it's gonna get really messy. So the only real way to kind of, uh, to, to, to use this for espresso, the workflow, which I actually don't mind, because I enjoy using the blind tumbler from the Weber Workshops EG1. So this is actually not a problem for me, but I know a lot of you are intent on grinding direct to portafilter. The kind of fix here is you grind into this, you take it off, they give you this attachment, which is magnetic. You put on, this fits perfectly in a 58, and it's essentially a blind tumbler. Do that, you can shake it, you can do whatever you want, pull off, and you have your coffee and your portafilter. But you won't be able to grind direct in the portafilter, at least not with the current iteration. I doubt there's really much they can do to change it unless they increase clearance here, but I don't really know how that would work with how the system is set up. Just so you know, for those people who love grinding into portafilters, that's not really an option with the WUG 2. Now, in order to stop popcorning, one thing that he adds are, is this magnetic little circle. So what you'll do is when you feed the beans in, this was another annoyance, the way he recommends it is you just make a gap like this, you toss the beans in, then you let it close up, and that way it doesn't popcorn out. That's because, of course, if you if you just take this off and you dump in, since it's very exposed burrs for the most part, they'll the beans will kind of jump, 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 unless there's a load of beans on top pushing it down. So if you're grinding a big enough dose, you could dump it in without anything there, then close it, because it's only at the very end where it'll start, start to popcorn. But this thing, you do need to kind of open up in order to feed. But with that new side doser, this becomes irrelevant. You won't even need it, because part of the system that ha hangs on the side is something that covers this for popcorning. It allows you to feed directly in through here and into the burrs themselves. David, I think, was one of the early um, reviewers of it or, or someone to kind of check it out. And so he let me know that that was uh, now available or about to be available, I should say. You have the adjustment ring here. So if you look up close, you'll see there are numbers and there are two ticks. So you can kind of see where you're at at all times. So it's kind of the same idea uh, uh, as like on the option OP100 or on the Coffeetech Monolith, where you have you have to have two stickers or two indicators, one on each side, 180 degrees away, so that as you're turning, you know where you're at roughly. And so when you rotate it to the right, you're going coarser. Rotate it to the left, you're going finer. And you have an infinite grind uh, grind settings because it's it's stepless. So you'll keep going until this ring just kind of pops off, uh, which would be way too coarse anyway. Way, but uh, you get the you get the drift because I know there are people out there worried about motor power this has a 500 watt motor inside of it which is absolutely more than enough and there are no annoying controllers on it that is uh, gonna cause any stalling I have not stalled at all seasoning this was a trip I took cardboard and I fashioned a funnel that I 
I put on top of another grinder so it would feed down and I covered it up with another piece of cardboard here so it wouldn't be popcorning out. And so what I did is I fed beans just straight in and then I put another piece of cardboard underneath here into a compartment for the grounds to be caught in. And so I would just feed beans in, feed beans in, and I was doing it, I, whenever I'm seasoning, I also like to test the capabilities about stalling and stuff. Uh, my friends at Nomad will send me off roasts, so a lot of times underdeveloped or past crop or something like that. So really dense beans, and that I'll use that a lot of times for seasoning just to see how it reacts at different RPMs. And even at 80 RPM with the cones or 400 RPM with the flats, I was never able to stall this. I still have never stalled this. It is just a beast. It's a workhorse and 500 watts is absolutely more than enough. There should be no worry with this motor whatsoever. We won't go into this because it's way too nerdy even for this video, but the way that they have the motor set up in order to switch the way it's spinning is really clever. It does a great job. It's very easy. Uh, and so that's not, that's also something to not really worry about. Let's go ahead. We're going to turn this on and grind some coffee. I currently have my one of a kind red speed coated Ditting Lab Sweet Burrs in here that I got from a friend that works at Hemro. So I'm gonna just brew a cup of filtered coffee with this so you can kind of see how this works. Then we'll swap out the burrs to the 83 millimeter Mazers, which by the way, I know that people think cone equals chocolate and they think, okay, bigger cone will be bigger chocolate. These are actually pretty clear burrs. This is one of the clearest con conical burr sets I know of actually. Um, that doesn't mean that they're really uniform. In fact, I think they're pretty ununiform. And so I, and when I say clear, I don't necessarily mean pleasant clarity. They just kind of give more, thinner bodies than you would really expect from something with, with cones, in my opinion. So the espressos I find to be much gooier on 71 millimeters that you can find like a Rober or something like that. The Mazers, even the Mazer espresso burrs, which you can get stock with this machine. The core burrs from Weber, I think do a better job at more a little more traditional espresso. Granted, the core burrs kind of are like medium roast. They go light. You can do dark with it really well. But these, these are not necessarily what you want if you're going for super traditional. So if you're someone that sees this and you're like, oh yes, I love to get my really traditional lever style shots, I would recommend for the cone section to get the 71 Mazers. If you're someone that's like, I love the gooey, but I also love like really bright pour overs, then get that and get the multi-purpose from SSP or get the HU from SSP or the ULF, which is the same thing as the HU according to Hansung, but you can use the magnetic carrier for that. So my pour over is now done and I wanted to just go ahead and show you some of the things about this grinder, which is just this LCD screen. Grinding doesn't take too long. I was grinding on the finer side for this pour over, just doing a two pour little pour over. And so as you see the RPM in real time shows up here. Now on something on some other grinders that do RPM, it doesn't really show you what it's like real time. So you might think this is oscillating a lot, but in reality, it's not. It's just telling you what's happening as it's meeting the beans, which is going to affect the RPM. And so it's trying using a PID controller to maintain a specific RPM. So there's gonna be small little bumps, but in reality, it's showing you exactly what it's like while grinding. So as you see, if I start the grinder, we're now at 426 and you can just hold the up all the way up to 700. So it overshot a bit. There we go. So it's at 715, 716. Then you can just, you know, go down. It goes down a bit at a time. But you can get very specific with your RPM. See that? Or you can just hold down. It shoots down quickly. Like that now down to 400. So it shows you in real time what that RPM is. So as you're grinding, as it's hitting the beans, as it's causing differences, fluctuations in the RPM, you see it in real time. And then of course, you just go up and down using these two buttons. Now there is a fan that runs and you might be able to hear that right now. So there's a fan that's running right when you turn it on. So the on off switch is on the back. It's a little red switch that you have to turn. So as you see right now, it's in like standby mode, but the fan is running similar to how the bent woods are. Turn it off. And there it goes, the fan goes off with it and now it's completely off. So I'm gonna take that over to the side with some nice lab sweet burrs, you know that's gonna be tasty. When the moon hits your eye like a big pizza pie, that's amore. 
Okay, very nice. So all you need in order to switch out the burrs is an M6 and an M8 hex tool. Now Dan has a full video on his YouTube with him talking about it, but well, I figured I'd just show you right here because, well, all in one stop so you don't have to keep scrolling around for different information. So here we go. First thing, we obviously have to take this off, put that to the side. Now make sure it's unplugged. You don't wanna, you don't wanna hurt yourself. And then the first thing we're going to do is we are going to take our big boy and there is a nut right in the center that we're just going to loosen. And then once it's loosened, you just unscrew it with my fingers. So that bottom burr just pops right on out. And that was the retention from the previous grind, which was at a espresso grind size, essentially. And as you can see, there's a little key as well, which you need to keep for the cone burrs. Retention is minimal here, and it's because there's not really any place for the grounds to hide other than in the burrs themselves. There's nothing below this. So whenever you have this funnel on, everything is coming into the funnel itself. So even if some's stuck on the walls, I mean, at the end, you can just kind of shake it or something, but there's virtually no retention on it. Once that's off, then you have four thumb screws you need to undo. I just like to loosen them all because there's a lot of springs in here holding it tight on there. And there we are. So this is what goes up in there and these springs are what hold the tension. So as you, you know, you turn the dial, it pushes, pulls, pushes, pulls. So they're very taut springs and there are six of them. On the back, we have our little bearing, which just sits right here. So you keep that bearing when we do the swap. So now we have this out, there's our burrs, you can see minimal retention. The new carrier is different than this. There are six holes for pins, but you never use six, you only get three with it. And so he's now changed it to where there's only three and there's only really one orientation you can do. But even on the new one, you need to notice that one of the, one of the holes is closer to the edge than the other ones. This is the one that will be at the back of the grinder. So when you're situating this in, you need to line the one closest to the lip to the back of the grinder. Whenever we put the pins in, a pin obviously goes there and then into the, the ones that are equidistant to it. So now we take the outer cone ring. So this one's already situated in the carrier. We have all of our springs in place like this. So first thing we're gonna do, just so we don't forget, we're gonna place that bearing right there. Nice. All right, then we take the pins. We find the one that's closest to the lip. It's that one. Then the other two are equidistant. Easy, no worries. And we're gonna take the one closest to the lip and we're just going to slowly fit it up in here. The tolerance is really tight, so you don't wanna go at an angle. And then you kind of wiggle until that pin finds its home, until all three pins find their home. Now we're in. So now what we're gonna do is we're gonna take this plate and we're gonna equally put them onto the springs. You don't want any spring kind of awry. We want them all equally on there. Boom, perfect. Then while we're holding tension, we grab our thumb screws you can just screw them all in, corner to corner, corner to corner, evenly pulling it up, adding tension to those springs until it's finger tight. Done. Now we put the actual cone on. As you can see, there's a slot here for our key that we needed to keep. Now I have an earlier version. There, There's a little bit of difference now, but I have these washers that I need to use. There's another PC he puts with it now, but I'm putting my washer right on top, just like so. And we're going to put it up onto the axle itself. Now that it's on, we're just going to find where the key fits. So I have my washer, I have my nut. Let me just put it up into the axle itself. We begin to screw it into place. Now we just tighten it with our big boy uh, key, but we're done. Now I said M6 and M8. The M6 would be for the burr screws. Uh, so if you need to change out the screws, you have your key out for that. So now that that's all done, we can just replace our funnel. And then we just need to remember to press that button to switch the motor so it spins the opposite direction. Then we plug it in. Now that we have it all switched, what we're gonna do is we're gonna switch it to cone mode. So we've already changed this button for the rotation. Now we need to switch the RPM. You turn on the motor and then you just hold down the button, the same button, the power button, for five to eight seconds. There we go. And it slows down. Now we're in the low RPM range for cones. So it is spinning right now, you just can't hear it because how slow it is. So we're at the 80 to, two, to 80 to 200 range. We'll just grind it at 80.
nice. About done. I'm just going to shoot up the RPM. Try and get anything that might be left in there out. Sounds like there's nothing really left. All right. Done. So we're going to take it. I like to kind of just tap it in case anything's stuck on the funnel. So now what I'm going to do is I'm going to magnetize this. Flip it here. Boom. Shake it a bit. Then you can demagnetize and boom, you have your funnel. All right, so we got the shot pulled. Now time for the ceremonial stir. Balanced, not the thickest body. I mean, this is a sort of lightly washed coffee, I guess, more medium, but a nice shot altogether. Took just a couple minutes to change out those burrs and give me a completely different profile than if I were to have pulled espresso with those lab sweets. We didn't really touch aesthetics. I think it's one of those things where it is what it is. It's it's not ugly. It's, I don't think it's beautiful, but I, I think it does a good job. It's sl it's slender. It fits well. It sit it'll sit right by your your espresso machine really easily. It's about the same height as an espresso machine, maybe a little shorter. Um, but in the end, you're getting so much value for the cost of this machine. Of course, it's not a cheap machine by any stretch of the imagination, but I believe it is truly the best value end game grinder you can get. When we're talking about end game, I'm talking about bigger burrs with a lot of capability like variable RPM, etc, etc, etc. And with this one, not only do you get all of that, but you're getting personalized alignment videos from the creator. You have, he's incredibly fast with response time. A lot of the users have been messaging back and forth as he's made new things for the grinder, like for instance, the blind burr carrier. And he's been able to ship people out on that first shipment, uh, the blind burr carrier to fit onto this. It's been a treat using it, especially now knowing there's the side feeder, because I truly hate feeding using this little cup. It is very annoying having to tap, 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 because how small the space is. Is. The inability to grind direct portafilter is a big irk for you, then obviously this is not for you. But for those of you who are considering something like, uh, you know, a more expensive grinder, I think this is something that should be on your list, on your short list, because uh, even if you want it to be strictly an 83 millimeter flat or strictly 80 or strictly 83 cone, I mean, this does what all the other grinders do and it does it really well. I really enjoy these smaller, you know, grinder companies where you have direct access to the creator, where you're getting constant feedback and you're getting constant uh, evolutions of the grinder that can retrofit onto the one that you have. I think that's a great thing. This is something that's been on your on your eye. I hope it answered a lot of the questions. If you have any other questions about it though, feel free to ask them below. I'll do my best to get to, to, get to as many as I can. And uh, yeah, if you enjoyed the video, please hit the like and subscribe. All of that really helps. And um, that's about it for me today. Today. So I hope that you brew something tasty today. And cheers.